tulip. Everything I touch dies! <laughs> I'm not going to cap. At first glance, Undead Unluck didn't look like it was going to have this much depth. I thought it was just going to be another one of those like shonen anime with like kind of like the JJK season one funny and heavy action type vibe. But week by week as I watched this shit, the story unfolded and I was greeted with a pleasant surprise. Undead Unluck is extremely unique and it has a way deeper storytelling bag than it looked like it has. The story takes like the predestination approach to a certain point in the story and then I'm not gonna lie, the way they reveal how everything is predetermined is actually pretty genius. You genuinely won't see it coming at all and that's part of what makes Undead Unluck such a fun watch. This show is super unpredictable. It pays to pay attention to any small detail that you notice while you're watching. There's so many things that the authors put in place that just seem like minuscule at first, but then you get later on in the story and then boom, all of a sudden this little detail has huge significance. There's a lot of mystery around a bunch of shit in this show, gang, and the way that they answer your questions by like exposing things like little by little is damn near perfect. I'm genuinely impressed by how great this first season was. I genuinely have no complaints at all. It had a bunch of emotional impact on me. The action was great. I genuinely love all the characters, and it's, it's built up like hella anticipation for what's coming next. I really mean when I say the creators of this shit have a deep storytelling bag, gang. Like, shit, shit goes deep, gang. No diddy, of course. No diddy, no diddy, no diddy. There's a lot to unpack in this story, and I'm super excited to talk about this shit, because this is like one of my favorite shows that came out recently. So, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. So, pull up a chair, let's chop it up. Love you forever, but sometimes we seem to disagree. Pray that you protect the end that creates my sympathy. I'm a mini you, one day I'll have a mini me. I'm your son, I shouldn't treat you like an enemy. I get annoyed when you point out all my feelings. You know, Undead All Up story starts out pretty normal. You know, nothing crazy. You know, just the main character is just about to jump off a bridge and end herself. Damn, nigga, what the fuck is this? A silent voice? Man, my heart can't take this shit no more. But nah, in all seriousness, the beginning sequel is pretty sweet and sad at the same time. So if you couldn't tell, there's an overall consensus that being like a negator is actually a horrible experience because the power you have can negatively and drastically affect your life depending on what power you have. And we don't get into any strategy until the end of the season, but they let us know pretty early on how bad it was for Fuko. You can already make assumptions because you know, she had to jump off a bridge into a train track and get by a train. So you can tell it's pretty bad. Fuko's backstory is sad as shit. Gang, she ended up watching her own parents die due to her unluck ability when they died on that plane. And with her ability being activated through touch, you can assume that like that will make life as a child very inconvenient for you and damn near every aspect available. Think about this shit, gang. Every time she played with other kids, they ended up getting hurt. It happened so much to the point where parents would come to her grandmother's house and tell her to keep Fuqua away from their children. So that's already pretty bad, right? But that's something that's even worse about this. Nigga, do you realize that she missed out on one of the best experience combos available coming up, folk? Bro, she missed out on the hugs and words of affirmation and reassurance combo, folk. Real niggas understand what I'm talking about. Real niggas know. That's not much of a better feeling than feeling down about some shit. Have you like your OG, your girl, even just like a female friend just give you a hug and reassure you. You know how loved you feel and how fast that pain and worry just escapes your brain and heart? Quick example, I'm about to yap for a little bit, hold on. So, quick example, shout out to my homie Jordan. And Jordan, if you're watching this, thank you and I love you, gang. And I hope life is treating you well like it's supposed to. I think it had to be around sophomore year of high school. And I was like, it was like a bunch of family shit going on in my house. And you know, a nigga like me, I'm mentally ill. <laughs> a nigga like me, I'm mentally ill. So we try to go, I'm trying to go through my day-to-day -day life acting like nothing wrong and shit. But one day, like some chinks in the armor started to show. And you know, I was, I was just down. I mean, hood on, antisocial, not speaking to no one, not talking to no one, not looking to no one. And I remember being on the, like the shuttle bus home and I was just looking out the window with my music on. And I'm usually like extremely talkative around the people I vibe with. And everybody like that I was cool with was on the bus with me at the time. I guess she noticed. And then I just felt some arms around me. And me not being very used to like receiving that kind of love and shit. I'm like, boy, who the fuck? <laughs> Who the fuck and what the fuck is going on here, fuck? Until I heard her say, like, everything is gonna be okay. Nigga, 
When I tell you that the anger and sadness that was trying to escape me and trying to like break out just halted, I really mean it. She didn't even know what was going on. She just know I needed comfort at the moment. And that's what make it funny is I didn't know I needed that comfort at the moment. To me, at least, that combo is like one of the most effective ways to show love. And the fact that Foucault couldn't get that from her people growing up is sad as shit in my opinion. Oh, look at you having the heart, Vaughn. Shut up, bitch. No, I'm just, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I like the sequence where she meet Andy a lot, though. I'm not gonna lie. He was really like a lantern in a dark tunnel for her. It was really cool. You know, they could have put some pants on that lantern. At least some PSDs and some Ethicas. But it's all good. At least there was a sister bar there. But nah, watching this in hindsight, it's a scene that'll definitely make you smile a bit. Even though Andy's literally trying to die after living all this time and die by her hand, you're just kind of happy to see Fuko get saved even when she gave up on herself type shit, if that makes sense. And I think she was relieved to finally have someone to interact with her normally without having worrying about hurting them and shit. So I think this is a cool scene. The introduction to the union was pretty cool too. I'm not gonna lie, I like to think ahead when it comes to shows, so I thought this was gonna be like an Andy or Fuko versus the union type beat, but it didn't seem like they were like evil. You feel me? And it definitely seemed like an interesting bunch of characters. So I wanted to learn more about like the other negators and shit because I know it's more out there. I'm glad they didn't take that route. Void was just kind of there to get packed up. So I don't really have much to say about him. But Shen is actually, well, like, he was actually pretty interesting when I first seen him. And he ended up being a pretty cool character. The whole sequence with Gina was great too. It's kind of messed up that, you know, had to fight her to the death, especially after she spent like quality time painting with her on the beach. Uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, the fight was really good though, and pretty funny too. Learning about Andy's history with her starts this kind of trend that they explore upon later when it comes to how long this nigga Andy actually has been alive. Side note, when that nigga threw them grenades at her ass mid monologue, that shit had me cackling. I think even Fuko was like, damn nigga, you not even go there, bitch. I love the scenery of the like the climax, the scenery of the climax of the fight too. The little crimson red tent on top of the body of water just looks super clean. Gina's death scene was pretty sad in my opinion too. I'm not gonna lie. This shit was powerful though, it was super powerful. Gina's monologue about like change and shit was pretty sad. But I like what Andy does here. I like how they wrote Andy right here. Knowing that all Gina wants is love from the nigga. He gave her a final kiss goodbye and like she tried to like fight him up and say now nah, I look like this and shit like that because her uh, anti-agent shit was wearing off and he tells her like a few wrinkles ain't gonna change how beautiful you are. I was like damn that's that's raw for uh, that's cute. I ain't gonna lie. That's, I like that and giving her damn near like giving her damn near her life's wish so at least her final moments could be happy. I love this moment. This is a major point where you start to see like the contrast and demeanor between Andy and Fuqua as well. At this point, the reality of the union and like life as a negator in general is really like setting in for Fuku. She's beginning to see shit like this, and this is something that you're gonna have to get used to if you wanna continue living on as a negator. Unfortunately, this is just how it is. Andy, on the other hand, it seems like completely unfazed by this and still able to be like rational and keep a smile on his face. You have to assume from that that he's been in this place too many times to break down here, and he's kinda experienced this over and over again. I really like how they did this because they could have just straight up just said this shit, but then they just gave you all the context and made you think this shit for yourself. Even without going into Andy's backstory until like further down the line, which I fuck with a lot. Andy and Foucault's pull up to the union table is a scene with a lot of charm in it too. I really like this scene. First off, I really like Andy and how he just had to make sure these niggas wasn't no bitch ass niggas. So the first thing he did was try the whole squad, folks. And another small detail that I enjoyed like that, looking back on the night hindsight, just seeing how every member reacted in a way that's consistent of how they fight during the whole show, like Billy's bullets, bouncing off of Tatiana's suit, and destroying one of Andy's fingers. It's like a cool way to show their abilities before we even know who these niggas are. It's really cool. It was a really minuscule but very cute detail that a lot of people won't pick up on. I also like how like the apocalypse book is structured. It's kind of like a video game. They get a quest at their home base, then they go out and do it, and they turn it back in at the base to get a reward for it. It's like plain and simple. Or they get their failure or penalty for it. Their first mission in the field is actually pretty cool. It gave us a lot of information information about the big bads leading up to guy himself i like how unafraid the creators are to be like a little unserious dirty like very serious times why these niggas was having a whole <laughs> wedding in the middle of this bullshit more sad shit though learning about them kids and how that zombie is a teacher is just that damn near die right in front of him is pretty rough i'm not gonna lie when andy explained the plan to use fuko's unluck and turn the zombies into like bombs and shit and then fuko was like nah hell no they don't know zombie want this shit and then the teacher 
went to go hug her, nigga, that shit was beautiful, bro. I'm not gonna lie. And this show does this shit so well with just doing shit and not saying anything, if that makes sense. Scenes like this are gorgeous. They don't water down the feeling with like empty words or phrasing. They just let the music and the actions on the screen carry the emotional message all by themselves. I love this shit. And then her running towards the spoil, fully ready to die, was just another raw ass moment, too. And the little detail, them showing like the sunflowers surrounding her was raw, because bringing up that small detail earlier that she loves sunflowers was really cool. But also, another small detail was having the sunflowers face her in the middle. Is actually a really cool small detail as well. I love that shit. Seeing Shan fight here was actually pretty cool too. It's, it's cool to see how he uses his ability, but the real star of the sequence, obviously, is seeing this nigga Victor come out. And boy, did folks not disappoint. Victor made extremely light work of spoil. <laughs> like, extremely. He beat his ass. And low key, Low key, now that I think about it, there's a detail that I missed on the first time. I missed this detail the first time. Victor could still just be out there, now that I think about it, because he cut his hand off and made another version of himself with Spoil's head when he sent him back down to Earth, back down to that uh that city. So he was still in space. And so this could just be another Victor just sitting out there, just waiting. Like, I didn't think about that. But anyway, them niggas wasn't done, because Victor was on bullshit with the Union. That nigga Victor kicked Shen in the forearm and turned his forearms into cheese whiz. I was like, oh shit. I See why you praise this nigga. He about to beat the shit out of y'all. And then the union pulled up and it took every single nigga to turn Victor back into Andy. Every single one of them. How you doing that, Gaxa? You know that 97% of the people that watch my videos aren't subscribed? That means that that 3% are considered real niggas. Hit that subscribe button. Also the like button. Join the real niggas. Have a good day. For this, the in between time was pretty cool too. Cause it was, it was nothing too crazy though, you know. Except for, I don't know. You got to see Jui solo a whole fucking alien race. Like. Like, yo, like, oh, some casual shit, like, like a Tuesday afternoon type shit. She solo an entire alien invasion, fuck. Oh, my God. The other repair sequence was really fire as well. Side note, fuck, the scene where they were walking by the water is funny as hell. Why had he just straight up ass Fuko, like, when you gonna get off that box, G? <laughs> <laughs> just, out, just out of nowhere, folks. And then it just cut to her ass running, trying to hit feet away from this nigga. And then he just got the hawk of her ass. Like, oh my God, this scene is so funny. They're pulling up to the actual boat is what shit started getting real. First things first, can we talk about how fine Fuko is? Like, gee, God damn. Hey, look at her, dog. Good Lord. Beating Shikaro is actually pretty cool too. I don't know what it is, but the scene where everybody's speaking English is pretty funny. His ability is pretty cool and useful. Being able to like freeze anything he looks at essentially is pretty like useful. And I see why niggas like unrepair wanted folks. I see why. The final squabble was pretty cool as well because we got to see Tatiana come out and see like her uh her power. We got to see her come out that damn pool ball and that bowling ball and use her ability as well. Was, her backstory is pretty sad as well. I'm not gonna lie. And Chikara's backstory is pretty rough too. Shocker. The way his parents died got to be one of the worst, bro. That is so crazy. He walked across the street because he didn't know he had this power yet, right? Obviously, because he's a kid and then he just don't know about this shit. He walked across the street first before his parents did. He turned around and he looked at them when they were in the middle of the crosswalk. He froze them in the crosswalk until Truckoon came in and third party them niggas. That was horrible. It was a tad bit funny, but that shit was sad as hell. I'm not gonna lie. Another thing, bro, them having to memory wipe this, his closest homie to make sure that he forgets Chikari even exists is sad as hell too. Like, goddamn, this show is dark. Like, good lord. The next assignment is to take out the uh Yumas. The Yumas is based on the four seasons. And once they get their mission, this is what shit start hit the fag. This nigga Billy just got the tweaking out of nowhere. I'm not gonna lie. I was wondering like what well, we was gonna get kind of that Billy centered episode. And we got it. It's it's just not what I was expecting. <laughs> for for this nigga Billy heard the quest and he was like, hmm. Okay. Let's nuke them niggas. But Billy, that's gonna kill thousands of innocent people. Hmm. Okay. Let's nuke them niggas. <laughs> like, what in the Henry Kissinger is going on here, nigga? What's going on? Billy is literally United States the character for you can't convince me otherwise. And all of a sudden, this nigga Billy just turns on the Union. He's trying to steal Apocalypse and the Round Table. There really wasn't anything hidden at this happening, so this is a huge surprise. If you say that you predicted this, you damn near lying. At this point in the story, I kind of thought that it was already pretty good. 
But in the words of Drewski, apparently I didn't have a clue in the fucking world. Cause after this, the story turned into just pure genius. The Yuno Fall sequence is probably my favorite sequence in the story so far because all the clever shit they do here. So first off, using that manga that Foucault was reading in the beginning of the show as this like prophecy piece for their fate is a phenomenal twist. I'm not gonna lie. Matter of fact, everything revolving around unknown is written crazy well. His whole story sad as hell, but it's great. Guess what? It's time for even more being a negator is horrible type beat backstory, and his shit is pretty bad too. Gee, I couldn't imagine bonding with my OG coming up and showing my love and art with her and all of a sudden just not being seen by her or the world and not being able to communicate with them either. And it's all because this nigga picked up a pen and he found a G-Lider, which is a normal looking ass pen. He just picked it up. I couldn't imagine the pain he felt standing right in front of her while she's actively in pain trying to find this nigga. I love my OG, so a nigga like me would have dropped some money and ugly cry for the rest of my life in front of her ass, for I'm not gonna lie. But letting him communicate with her through manga is another cool ass touch because that's how they bonded before all this stuff happened. But it's sad as hell when you hear her say things like, man, Kuno would have loved this. Had me sad and mad to the point where my inner nigga watching a horror movie in the theater came out. My ass was like, because he wrote it, man. Fuck. <laughs> Also, him him being this like all-knowing figure is actually a really good touch because it put him in a dilemma. It put him in this like big dilemma as well because he wants to change what he knows is gonna happen, which is like everybody fucking dies, like everybody just gets smoked. So putting him in that dilemma where he has to change that and he gets to the point where he don't know the story no more is actually a really cool touch as well. The part where Unknown said Fuko and the Andy's memories was fire too. And you guessed it, this shit was pretty sad as well. So in my Freer video, I talked about how Freer and being the elf is pretty tragic because she always outlives her companions. And she, she experiences the pain of loss and cycles, damn near like in seasons, right? It's literally the exact same with Andy, but what makes it potentially even more sad is the fact that this nigga couldn't die if he wanted to. And in some cases, he technically experienced the death with his comrades. He just came back. This is funny. So since Andy and Victor are the same being technically and they share the same body, if you go into Andy's memories, you can technically go into Victor's memories as well. And Victor was not having it. <laughs> when he said that he was going to hunt Fuku ass down to kill her ass for, he was not lying because he smoked her shit numerous times. <laughs> this shit was so funny. This is how Mr. X was on my ass in the RA2 remake, and that may or may not be the reason I never beat that game. Hey, phone them, you a bitch. You damn straight, gangster. That's my name. Don't wear it out. The fight against Victor was really good, and this sequence kind of peeled back a few layers of his character, which was pretty cool. They revealed that him and Juiz actually had an intimate relationship at a point, and they also revealed that Juiz has been using this artifact called Ark to loop her and keep her alive so she could finally defeat God. Even though, like, you know, it's failed every single time. And we learned that Victor's goal is to just put her out her misery because he cares about her. But after they beat Victor, he admits that he has hope in their journey to defeat God because of Foucault's progression with her unluck power. This scene is super cool because this shows that Victor is more of a person than we thought he was. He's been revered as this, like, God of War type nigga with no motives, but they finally let us know some here, even without telling us everything, which is pretty satisfying. The final battle with Autumn was fire because it showed us more of unrepair and where his brain is at in this whole thing and this whole conflict. Unknown sacrifice was super beautiful and the line where he says like I don't know what happens from here is amazing. Signifying the possibility of like defeating God maybe like it may be actually a chance that you can. He don't even know if they'll fail or not. It's, it's more of a chance this time like before he knew that they were going to die all the time. And in the process, he put a chink into our repairs like tough guy act too, making him and Andy actually work together and warming us up to more of a potential partnership in the future. It's not certain right now, but they kind of heading at it. I can't even but tell you how excited I am to see what happens next in this shit. I I'm gonna keep it a bed with you. There's so much shit set up for the next season of this show, like the Billy conflict, the other Yumas, the final battle with God is still like yet to be resolved too. And th there's just so much to be excited for considering like how they got into their bag with storytelling in this last sequence. I can't imagine how good the writing is going to be going for when we deal with more complex conflicts and like what other nuggets of things that I missed early on in the show that's going to get picked up later on and be like, oh, this is why this was here. I can't imagine what's going to happen. And this is what makes it so, so exciting. We still haven't even fully explored all the members of the unions and their powers and shit yet either. And like any conflict that they dealing with, it's any more sad ass backstories that we need to see about these niggas. There's a, there's an empty seat as well. Like Billy's seat is now empty. So we have to find a replacement for that nigga too. Like it's very safe to say that Undead Our Luck is like that gang. Like it is very safe to say. And I'm super excited to see what they got going on going forward. And I, I kind of missed this show since it ended. I really missed this shit. But 
That's all for me, man. As always, man, I hope you have a great day, man. Love y'all, man. Peace. I'm a mini you, one day I'll have a mini me. I'm your son, I shouldn't treat you like an enemy. I get a no.